السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ بردر محمد خان السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ویلکم ٹو دی فسٹ سیشن آف ٹو ڈے آئی وڈ لائک ٹو سی بردر محمد خان ہیئر اف از ان دی آڈینس السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ دس سیشن از اباؤٹ مسلم ورلڈ ون فگر دیٹ ہیز کم آؤٹ ایز ون آف دی موسٹ رناؤنڈ ان دس ایئر نائنٹین نائنٹی تھری وی لو ہم ریسپیکٹ ہم اینڈ وی سی ہم آلموسٹ ایوری ڈے آن دی ٹیلی ویژن دیٹ از بردر عزت علی بیگوچ ناؤ ہز ریلیشن شپ ود اسنا is very old. He has visited us several years ago and when he was in jail, he wrote a wonderful book which American Trust Publications published. The name of the book is Islam Between East and West. This is authored, written by President Alia Ali Izzat Begovic. This is the publication of American Trust publications, which is an affiliate of Islamic Society of North America. In order to understand how this great man thinks about the role of Islam in the West, in order to understand the charismatic and the balanced leadership that he provided to Bosnia at a one of, in one of the world's greatest crises, I think you should try to have a copy of this book from the Islamic book service in the bazaar there. So I would like to request now Brother uh, Salim Kayani, who is the director of the American Trust Publications, to conduct this session. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, we start this session, which is about the Muslim world problems and promises. It's very strange indeed. And all the thinking Muslims everywhere, they are, most of them, confused as to why the Muslim Ummah, who was supposed to be dominant, who was supposed to occupy an honorable status and position in this world has been reduced to the most backward, ignored and insulted people on the face of earth today. What are the causes and how we can get out of this mess is in fact the focus of the thinking and attention of every thinking Muslim. And in this session, we are fortunate to have with us Brother Khurram Jamurad from Pakistan. He is the Naib Amir, Vice President of Jamaat Islam in Pakistan. And as most of you know, Jamaat Islami is prominent in the sense that they have shown the way. They have been struggling and they have put forth a comprehensive plan and scheme of life. And we will listen to him as to how we can address these problems. Our second speaker is Brother Siraj Wahad. All of you know him. There is no need to introduce him, of course. He will, in fact, we will be our second speaker. 
So with these brief words, I will call upon Brother Khurram to come and address us. Brother Khurram Murad. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله We live in a time of crisis Crisis is not something new because human beings and human history has always been passing through various sorts of crises. But this crisis is a very severe, deep and acute crisis, which does not have much parallels in human history. It is not only the Muslim world is sprawling from one end of the planet to the other, comprising about one-fifth of human race. Standard bearers of the last revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the entire mankind which is in turmoil. Indeed, if you look at the situation and take a superficial view, one might come to the conclusion that the history has come to an end. I have repeated this controversial statement about history having come to an end, not in the sense in which it was pronounced. History has not come to an end in the sense that it human race has reached its destination, the destination of liberal democracy, the destination of the triumph of liberal democracy. Because in that sense, human history can never come to an end unless the whole chapter is closed. History will continue to flow, but the crisis that the mankind faces today is so acute and severe, of which Muslims, being a part of them, have an equal, rather a larger share, that one thinks as if we have reached a dead end, an impasse from which it is difficult to know where we shall go forward. If history has not reached its destination, it has reached an end, then it must take a turn. There must be some history-making event in the offing, which will give a turn to history to move in some direction from this dead end. If I begin to recite the woes and the wounds and the tribulations that inflict the body of the Muslim Ummah, there will be no end to it. They are being repeated again and again in their homes, in, their, in our media and in this conference as well. Corrupt rulers, masses, who don't have the strength to change their rulers, economies which are disintegrating, moral fiber which seems to have broken down, Ummah lost in wilderness, in the forest of this crisis-ridden world. Let us not spend time on repeating all those tribulations. If we look at the mankind again, the list 
of these wounds which inflict the humankind is limitless. The violence, the bloodshed, the paper economy which may collapse any day, the concepts of development which have overpowered the whole world, and finally the emptiness and the vacuum which has been created within individuals all over the world. So we are in this state of turmoil, the whole mankind as well as the Muslim world. But as I said from the dis de this dead end, the history must make a turn. And while this turmoil has its perils, its threats, its problems, it also has its promises. It also has potentials. And it is the potential that we have to be aware of and we have to try to come true to the promise that times are offering us. When, co when, when communism collapsed, a leading weekly, British weekly, The Economist, wrote a three-page article raising the question, is the collapse of communism a history-making event? And then the writer went on to list all those events which, in his opinion, were of the history-making nature. And to be fair, he also counted among them the event of Hijra in 632 Common Era. But then finally he said that the collapse of communism is not a history-making event. But the history is impatiently waiting to be made. And then he says that perhaps the kind of issues around which the next history-making event will take place are those issues to which both the Islamic fundamentalists and the Christian fundamentalists claim that these are their issues. And these are not economic and political issues, but they are issues, I quote him in his language, which lies somewhere beyond in the mist, and which I take the liberty to translate, the issues which lie in ghaib. These are the issues according to which the history making is going to take place out of this crisis into which we find the entire Muslim world as well as the whole mankind. So the key is in our hands. The Muslim world itself is subject to the worst kind of tribulations inflicted upon it. To quote the words of Sayyid Madhudi Rahmatullahi Alayh, the whole world has turned into a thorny forest and the thorniest part of that forest has come to the lot of Muslims. Because they were supposed to make this forest a garden and they failed in their duty. And therefore they had to take the worst suffering and beating. So this is the promise which lies here. And the Muslim world's problems, we need no recounting. It is the promise of our times that I would like to concentrate upon in the few minutes that are at my disposal. Muslim people all over the world suffering from a number of diseases which are diagnosed by doctors and uh, cures are suggested. In my view, at the root lies just one disease. And that disease is a lack of direction and purpose. A sense of purpose, a sense of direction a goal to pursue is for a people like soul is to human body. A people without a purpose, without a direction, without a goal to pursue, on the face of it, they seem to be living, but inside they are dead. And when they are dead, the body begins to de de disintegrate. And that is what happened to the body of the Ummah. 
different types of goals are being prescribed for the ummah for a long time during the, nis- the last half a century. But unfortunately, none of these goals which are being prescribed, which are being suggested, which are being pursued is a cure for the problems which afflict the Muslim Ummah. Factories, GNP, motorways, industrial production, economic growth, these are not the kind of objectives. Each one of them is immensely important, but they are not the kind of objectives for which this Ummah was created. The purpose for which this Ummah was created was stated very clearly. فَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطَلْ لَتَكُونُوا شَهُدَا عَلَى النَّاسِ It was given a name, هُوَ سَمَّاكُمُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ He has named you Muslims. Not the businessmen, not the engineers, not the doctors, not the Arabs and Pakistanis, but Muslims. And you came into being because of Ibrahim alayhi salam's prayer, min zurriyatina ummatam muslimatal lak, raised from our progeny, an ummah which lives in total surrender to you, O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what that goal could be? What that direction could be? But that purpose could be which will infuse and inspire the Muslim body politic with a soul which will unite it, which will give it strength, which will it carry it forward, which will give it the courage and the strength to overcome the various problems that afflict us. I would refer to a small part of the Quran Majid narrating about Ibrahim alayhi salam. Many of you must have the whole thing in their hearts and minds. Where he looks at the sun and the moon and the stars. And each time he says, this is my goal, this is my purpose, this is my Rabb, this is my Lord. Then he utters a sentence which must be inscribed on the heart of every Muslim. Inni la uhibbul afili. I don't desire, I don't love things which are going to vanish. Inni wajjahtu wajhiya lil lazi fataras samawati wal ardh hanifam wa ma ana minal mushriki. I would turn my face, the whole individual heart, the collective life, we have turned our direction toward the one who has created. And we make no partners in that act of turning towards him and taking him as our goal, as our direction. So that purpose is for which the people will live and die. That is the purpose they would love. That is the purpose for whose sake they would lay down their life and their time and their energy and their money. In the salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya mumati illahi rabbil alim. It was the kind of purpose, the kind of goal, which the Muslim Ummah acquired in the beginning. It was the power and strength of that goal which within hundred years enabled them to take the message of Islam from Spain through Indus Valley to Kashgar and Bukhara right to the heart of China. This was the goal. Not that that nuclear bombs, not that high large universities, not they were the most advanced in technology, but as the Orientalist Hamilton Gibbon writes, it was the cry of La ilaha illallah which brought the Arabs out of Arabia and the name of the orphan Muhammad وسلم, was being raised from Spain to China within 100 years. That was the power, that was the atomic nuclear bomb, that was the source of strength, that was the powerhouse because they had a purpose, their goal. They had a destination to pursue, and that inspired them, that gave them strength, that put them forward. We must be very clear, and at least I, in my heart, do not have the least doubt 
that all the cures that our doctors are suggesting for a long time will not cure the illnesses that plague the body of the ummah as a whole. They will not. We may implement not one but hundred five-year plans. We may erect thousands of factories. Others are doing it better than us. We may build hundred miles of motorway. Others have built thousands of miles of motorway. We cannot compete with them. But the message that we have, that the entire mankind should live in total surrender and complete obedience to its creator, is something which nobody else has. It is the mission which was entrusted to us. The first victory that Islam had against its enemies on the battleground of Badr, the first victory which sealed the fate of non-Islam and which pushed Islam towards its destiny, which is called Yom al furqan by the Quran, on the day the Prophet stood up, our leader, on behalf of us, for coming generations, he pledged and he told Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if this handful of people are destroyed today, you will not be worshipped on the face of this earth. This was not a challenge. This was a pledge that if you give us victory, then we shall carry the message of your worship to the four corners of the world. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them victory because of that pledge. So that is the goal. And without that, in my opinion, opinion would be a short word, it's my firm belief, all other cures will not help. Unity is an elusive goal. We are pursuing ever and ever. But whether you erect OIC, you bring an Arab League, whatever you do, the unity will not come. Because unity will come only when the people assemble around their goal. When the goal supersedes all other goals and all other loyalties. All these goals are elusive. And let me say this also with firm conviction that even economic development will not come unless the Muslims have a purpose and that purpose can be the only purpose for which they have been created. Because economic development by itself cannot be the purpose and goal. Economic development for the sake of a higher purpose can be an economic development. If you study the human history, you will find that only those people who had high civilizational goals, they were able to go forward and not only achieve their civilizational goals, but as well as achieve supremacy in the world. The same thing happened to Muslims. Handful of people in ragged clothes with no arms, they came out and then flourished in science, technology, business, built mm, splendid cities, civilizations in North Africa, in Spain, in Baghdad. All this followed that small structure in Medina, which was built not of uh, mighty pillars, but on the dead trunks. Its floor was of pebbles. From that small structure sprung the whole civilization. It did not start with mighty cities and civilization. It was the goals which were mighty, which the people pursued and reached their destination. So even the goals of economic development, as we saw, we are going wilderness. I know about my country. In 50 years, every citizen has become indebted to the foreign power. We will loan with generations will be paying back. 36% of our budget goes for interest and loan payments. People are poor. They don't have clothing, they don't have drinking water, they don't have health facilities, they don't have education. And this is the economic development. We have factories. We are building a motorway. But we don't have the people who can fill up their stomachs and sleep with contentment during the evenings. So everything is going to depend on that goal. I think whatever problem the Muslim world faces today, the solution lies in this pursual of goal. I seek your forgiveness for quoting something which is not in English, but the famous Pakistani poet Iqbal said, Zindagani ra baqa az muddaas 
کاروانش را درا از مداست لائف کین بی مینٹین اونلی بائی اے پرپز ان گول اینڈ دی کاروان کین موو فارورڈ اونلی بائی اے پرپز ان گول شارٹ اف دیٹ دیر کین بی نو سولوشن بٹ دین مائی برادرس اینڈ سسٹرس لیٹ می ٹرن اے لٹل ان ورڈ وی ٹاک ان گلوبل ٹرمس we want to solve the global problems we are engaged in issues which are far beyond our own borders but then the key really lies inside your heart let each one of us look inside the heart and find what is there the hadith from tabrani says that if you want to find what is your station in the eyes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your station in the eyes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will determine your station in this world as well because he is the master of this world the keys are in his hands mafatih al ghaib he knows and he gives whatever he wants to give nobody else can give then if you want to find what your status position is in the eyes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look inside your heart what place you assign to him in your heart is is he, does he enjoy the supreme and highest place are you prepared to give everything unto him are you prepared to sacrifice whatever you have for his sake are you prepared to obey him in every walk of your life if you do that then you will be the leaders of mankind is it tala ibrahim rabbuhu bi kalimatin fatammahunna qala inni ja'iluka linnas when the ibrahim when allah subhanahu wa taala tested ibrahim with a number of things and he complied and fulfilled all of them then allah subhanahu wa taala said that i am now going to make you the leader of mankind that promise was made when he fulfilled all the tests prescribed by allah subhanahu wa taala for him So really we have to look inside ourselves. The secret is each one of Muslim, which is a microcosm of the whole universe, you are like an atom. An atom, so long as it is not aware of the immense power it possesses, it can roam about and nobody will take notice of it. For thousands of years an atom was there. but nobody can generate the power and force out of it because they were unaware of the secrets and power that the atom had so each human individual each man woman and child who is here who is anywhere in the whole planet he has got that atom inside him that heart wa nafakhtu fihi min ruhi allah subhanahu wa taala has blown his own spirit in him and his heart is the abode of allah subhanahu wa taala once you become conscious aware of the immense unlimited power that allah subhanahu wa taala has placed in you then each one of you can be the maker of that future the maker of that human history each one of you can take the reins of history in his hands or her hand and make give it a turn and give it to the direction of islam but otherwise wishes and speeches and books and prayers are not going to help because future does not lie somewhere like man and salwa which will drop in your lap it has to be earned laysa lil insan illa ma sa there nothing for anybody except what he strives for or she strives for if you think that just by listening to speeches attending conferences erecting structures delivering beautiful speeches future will become ours it will not by work by effort by hard work by dedicated work by each and every individual each individual is accountable for himself and so that is where you have to turn yourself inside out and change yourself if you think that others will change and i will remain where i am nothing will happen no cure will come all these organizations and conferences will produce 
no result. But once each one of you makes a determination that I'll change myself, I'll do my duty as an ambassador of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wherever I am located, in whatever neighborhood I am, then you will change, then the Ummah will change, then the mankind will change, then the history will take a turn around the issues which are in your book and which are in Islam. The issues of ghaib, you minuna bil ghaib. From there the whole guidance starts. This is the kind of issues which are going to make the future, which are going to solve the problems that the Ummah faces at the present moment. Finally, brothers and sisters, I would like to say that this future, I am 100% sure, belongs to Islam. Again, I take your permission to quote Dr. Iqbal, who said, जानता है जिस पे रोशन बातने अय्याम है मुजदूकियत फितनाए फरदा नहीं इस्लाम है 56, 60 years ago he predicted that socialism in, in the words of Iblis socialism is not the threat to me and my system it is not a threat of tomorrow socialism will disintegrate it is Islam which is going to be the threat to my system tomorrow. It is for Islam that the world is waiting, the history is waiting. Again his words, Jo tha nahi hai, jo hai na hoga, yehi hai kharf hai mehramana, kareeb tare namood jiski usi ka mushtaq hai zamana. What was here is no more, and what is now here will also be no more. This is the secret of the time, message of time. Whatever is very near to appear, that is Islam, for that the history, the mankind, the world is looking for. But that promise is not made to me and you personally. It is not made to Arabs and Pakistanis. It is not made to born Muslims. When Ibrahim asked, I mean, Zurriyati, will my children also inherit this leadership? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, La yanalu adiz zalimi. My promise is not for those who will be doing wrong to themselves. So finally, my brothers and sisters, the history can be ours, the Muslim world's problems can be solved, the future is going to be shaped according to Islam. This cannot be doubted, but who will do it, that is not decided. You can be those persons, we can be those persons, and if we, we don't do our task, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْ يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَكُونُوا أَمْسَالَكُمْ If you turn away from the opportunities, the promise, the task and mission that we have given you, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace you with other people and they won't be like you. يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَهُ He would love them more than anything else and they would love him more than anything else. So the whole thing is clear, crystal clear. But each person has to do his duty and the organizations have to be alive to the challenges of history and time with that macro view of the whole world. Then if you go inside, if you go with a narrow view inside you, you will become a mystic. But if you go with a macro view of the whole world, the challenges of history, the mankind suffering, and then you go inside yourself, then you will be born as a new people who will bring and construct a new world. Waakhru Dawana and Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Allah Akbar. Taqweer. Listening to Brother Khuram, one might think that the condition of the Muslims is like that man with the staff of Moses in his hand and who is terrified of the artificial snakes. He has all that he needs with him. The only condition is that he should be aware of, conscious of what he has, and should be sincere and true to what he is given. One of the translators of the Quran and Orientalists said that when this Quran came, it changed the savages of Arabia as if by a magic wang. 
all of a sudden a new nation sprang up, nation of leaders, scholars, and commanders. That miracle, that book is still with us. That is the message of Brother Purim. The only condition is that we should understand it and be true to its message. And that message was potential, had great potential in the past. It did show a miracle, and again it can. And look what we have got and where it comes from. We need light. There is darkness. We need lamp, a radiant lamp. And there comes a radiant lamp, Siraj Wahad. It is a radiant lamp. And it is a miracle of Islam, I say, that it comes from America. It's come from New York. And that miracle, I hope, and I believe, will continue till the day of judgment. And we will have lights, thousands, of these radiant lamps, if not from Muslim world, from those, as he, Brother Quram said, those who are not on, in those other lands. So with these words, I call upon Brother Siraj Wahad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له نشهد أن محمد نبيه ورسوله أما بعد my beloved brothers and sisters in a few hours sometime today tonight tomorrow morning many of you would be getting back to your homes getting on the plane, on the buses, in your cars, to go back home. As you're flying back home to Florida, in Los Angeles, California, Detroit, Michigan, wherever you're going back home, what will you be thinking about? You are supposed to leave this conference better and do something. The theme, Muslims for a Better America. What will you do when you go back? I ran into a sister yesterday. She said, Brother Siraj, there's some sessions I, I just can't attend because they're so negative. And perhaps this segment here could be one of the most negative. When you talk about the condition of the Muslims around the world. Yet, brothers and sisters, Friday morning at 4 a.m., I was awoke, thinking about you and thinking about us, our condition of the Muslim Ummah around the world. I had been going all over the country, all over the world, reminding us how weak we were. But on that morning, it suddenly occurred to me a different perspective. That we may not be as weak as we think we are. What will you do when you go back? Brothers and sisters, there's no doubt that there are people around the world, especially in this country, that are working hard to keep Muslims divided. They're doing something to us. I want to uh, share with you an experience that happened to me a few weeks ago on my way from Los Angeles back to New York City. I got in a plane and I sat down on the aisle seat and a woman came 
with her bags and she sat next to me in the window seat. And I can tell from the corner of my eyes that she was looking around. And I know she was looking for another seat. And I said, she's going to change her seat. Watch. She got up and got her bags and said, excuse me, uh, I have to see something. So I watched her as she walked in front of the plane. She walked on the other side and she got into another seat. I said, alhamdulillah, that's more space for me. But then as I was sitting there writing some notes, this is before the plane took off, another woman came in. And she sat down next to me. And she started looking around. Now, you know, I, I, I started checking myself. I said, well, maybe, you know, I'm, I better check myself, baby. And I said, you know, she's going to get up too. And I mean, I was okay. And she got up and she changed in the show. She said, in fact, uh, she's getting off the plane. And she did. The following week, I was in the city of Winnipeg. And the brothers had given me, and sisters had given me some kind of award that I had in a, in a little package. Now, brothers and sisters, when you go to another country, you have to go through security, you have to go through customs, and you have to go through immigration. When I got through security and got to the immigration officer, he looked at what I had in my hand. He stepped back and said, what is that, a bomb? Now, either he was joking or he really believed it. If I was joking and said, this is the bomb, ha, 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 this is the bomb, joke, 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 they put me in jail because you're not allowed to joke like that. You can't play like that. They will put you in jail so you don't joke. So the question is, why would this immigration officer believed that I have a bomb. Why would these women on the plane move from the seat next to me because this man looked like a Muslim, looked like a fundamentalist, looked like a terrorist, looked like a some kind of fanatic man, fanatical man because he had this on his head and he had a beard and he wore some kind of strange dress. This kind of scenario is being multiplied all over America. Why? You say the media. But what is the media? The media is not some uh, nebulous, mysterious force somewhere. Media are people with ideas and agendas. But the question is, brothers and sisters, why would the media want to portray Muslims in such a negative light? Why? In the next few moments, inshallah, I would like to give, in my opinion, a critical analysis of what's going on in the Muslim world and why I am not negative at all. You may not understand what I'm about to say, but I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Bosnia. Bosnia is absolutely the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether you understand it or not, Bosnia is here by the will of Allah. There's a reason for it, and there's something for us to learn. What is Allah speaking to the Muslim Ummah about Bosnia and the rest of the world? What is Allah saying? Allah has something to say. What is he saying? And if you look around, brothers and sisters, you will understand the wisdom of Basnia. I'd like to leave you with these words of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And this is the basis of my, my small talk. I find this saying of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so great, so magnificent. It can make me have hope for the future. 
قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عجبا لامر لامر المؤمن ان امره كله له خير وليس ذلك لاحد الا للمؤمن wonderful statement wondrous is the affair of the muslims wondrous is our affair everything of his affair is good for him everything not some things but everything because you must always understand allah is always in control allah is never out of control he's in control and sometimes if you look at the picture in a narrow way you don't understand the big picture therefore you feel negative and you don't understand and you cry because you don't understand the big picture and Allah is in control over everything the invisible hand of Allah is there in Bosnia there in Somalia there in Palestine there among the Kurds there in Iraq there in Palestine, wherever you go, no matter what it looks like on the outside, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control. Listen, if some kind of good befalls him, that's good for him. He's thankful to Allah. Whatever Allah gives him or her a piece of bread, a newborn baby, a husband, a wife, a job, education, whatever Allah gives to us, we thank Allah so much because we realize everything comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then whenever some calamity happens to us, we're patient. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And then Allah will reward us for that. Listen. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تبارك الذي بيده الملك وهو على كل شيء قدير الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور blessed be he him in whose hand is the dominion of the heavens and the earth he Allah created death and life test you who's best in conduct Bosnia is a test in my opinion brothers and sisters Bosnia is the barometer to measure the faith of the Muslims and it is a barometer or gauge to manifest the condition of the peoples of the earth President Clinton will be measured by what he does in Bosnia. The countries in Europe will be measured by humanity and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based on what they do in Bosnia. And Muslims will gain or lose by what we do in Bosnia and around the world. One thing that I have learned, brothers and sisters, in my opinion, as a result of what's happened in Bosnia, many Muslims, perhaps, who would never have gone to Jannah, might, in fact, go to Jannah. What do you mean? Maybe sometimes our faith is low and we don't practice. But I know a fact now, there are many Muslims in Bosnia who tell me now they're practicing when they didn't practice before. Because now Allah put them in a position where they have to fight for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And every day now they're thinking about Allah. They're forced now to think about Allah when they find themselves leaving their homes. When they find themselves persecuted. When they see their families killed and yet they would fight with little weapons. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take from them many shuhada and martyrs because as a result of what's happening in Bosnia now they're struggling but not only that I know a Muslim from America African American left his comfortable home in Detroit where you going brother I'm going to Bosnia to help my Muslim brothers and sisters there 
He goes to Bosnia, leaves his home, leaves his family behind, leave everything behind and go to help his Muslim brother. His skin is black and the Muslims in Bosnia, his skin is white, but it doesn't make him a difference because in the Mali movement known as Ikhwa, the believers are brothers. He goes there now, he, he goes there now and he loses. He goes there now and he loses his life. All around America, Muslims say, we got to do something for Bosnia. I know Muslims who went to their bank account, withdrew all their money out the bank to give it to the Muslims in Bosnia. Why? So now around the country, we have the Bosnian task force. Brother Abdullah Malik uh, Mujahid calls me on the phone. Brother Sadaj, come on, we have to do something. We get on the phone with leaders around the country. Come on, let's do something for Bosnia. Muslims get on the buses and they go to Washington, D.C. 50,000 Muslims coming together. Imam Wan al Muhammad, Imam Jamil al Amin, uh, Brother uh, uh, Idris, uh, Abdel Idris Ali from Isna and Ikna, and all of the Muslims now coming together. Why are you coming together? Bosnia is pushing us together. Wondrous is the affair of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You look at something negatively, but Allah knows His plan is wide and expansive. And I say to you, brothers and sisters, the condition of this Ummah is not as bad as you may think. I say this to you. I was thinking about America. Why is it that the press is portraying Islam in such a negative way? It's not an accident. You know why? Brothers and sisters, never forget Media is business. Don't think when you look at ABC, CBS, you're looking at people who are so objective. We have to tell the truth. These people are business people. Their newspapers, their magazines, is a business. And also they have prejudices. Why does it seem like all over the world, Muslims are betrayed in a very negative way as terrorists. Can I tell you why? It's to fool the masses of the people to cover up the real terrorists. If I am a pickpocket, ain't gonna pick your pocket, I would try to get you to look at somebody else. You better watch that person over there. Watch him, watch him. Watch that person over there, look. And brothers and sisters, believe it or not, that's exactly what this media in America and around the world is doing. Isn't it crazy? They call Muslims terrorists, but yet all over the world, we're being terrorized as Muslims. But yet we the terrorists. What acts of terrorism have we done? You come and take our land in Palestine. What terrorism have we done? And we try to get it back. How? We throw rocks and we're terrorists. You take our land in Bosnia because we're Muslims. And we try to fight to defend ourselves. And our land is being shrunk. And now you want to give us a peace deal and give us a piece of land and say, here, take this. But yet we're terrorists. And you don't even allow us to defend ourselves there. But yet we're terrorists. And all over the world you find the same way. Muslims are being labeled terrorists. But who are the real terrorists? Brothers and sisters, I wish I had time. But I don't, so I'm going to share this information with you. And I want you to think. The World Trade Center, how many people died there? Six people. That's unfortunate. Anytime one person dies, one innocent person, that's unfortunate. Muslims should never gloat. We should never condone what was done there. But look how the enemies of Islam exploited what appeared to be 
appeared to be some action of some Muslims, what appeared to be. How horrible, six people lost their lives. Tragic. But what if I told you that last year there was an act of terrorism that caused over 400,000 Americans to lose their life and 2.5 million around the world. What would you say about that? Don't you think that that's terrorism if 400 people were murdered and you could have prevented it? 2.5 million people around the world murdered and you could have uh, 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 stopped it? Should that not be real terrorism? Listen to this, brothers and sisters. You may not understand what I'm about to say. I'm going to make a dua that every Muslim in this convention, at least those of you who smoke cigarettes, I pray to Allah that on this day you never smoke a cigarette again. Give it up. Stop it. Why? It is a proven fact that every year over 400,000 Americans die premature death as a result of cigarette smoking. And of that 400,000, 53,000 are the victims of what you call secondhand smoke. They don't smoke cigarettes, but they live in the house and their father smokes cigarettes. And so they, they breathe in the secondhand smoke from their fathers and from their mothers, little babies now. They don't smoke cigarettes, but they die of cancer because their mother and their father, their uncle in the house smoke cigarettes. 53,000 a year. But don't stop there. Worldwide, about half of the adult men and 10% of adult women smoke. Today, more than 250 million people in China smoke 1.5 trillion cigarettes a year. Given current trends, 50 million Chinese children alive today will eventually die from tobacco-related diseases. They know this. By the year 2040, cigarette smoking will kill a total of 12.5 million people a year. So, why don't they do something about that? You know why? Big business. Money. Do you know that cigarettes is the most profitable business on this earth? It costs less than one half penny to produce one pack of cigarettes. One company, Philip Morris, in one year spent over two uh, billion dollars to advertise their product, to get you to smoke. Two billion dollars. You should ask the question, if they spent $2 billion in one year, how much did revenue did it produce? One company, over $48 billion in, 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 in finances, in revenue. More income than Saudi Arabia. More money than the gross national product of many nations around the world. One company, tobacco company, man, they make billions of dollars all over the world because get you to smoke and each cigarette contains over 4,000 chemicals. 
And one of the chemicals that have nicotine that make you have a desire to smoke over and over again. So you smoke one pack a day, two packs a day, and money go out your pocket and go into the pockets of your enemies. And at the same time, you die and you kill your children and people around you. I hate smoke. Don't come near me if you got smoke. Smoke getting all in my clothes and I have to smoke that cigarette. I go on a plane to go to another country and I sit down in the no smoking section and the guy next to me pull out a cigarette. I said, put that thing out, man. Get out of here with that smoke. I say, brothers and sisters, in my conclusion, what is the Muslim Ummah like around the world? To me, because the United States of America is spending so much energy against the Muslims, there must be a reason why. Why are they focusing their attention so much on the Muslims? Muslims are enemies. Why? What are they preparing the people for? Brothers and sisters, if you study how the United States of America works. In, the, in Great Britain, there's a magazine put out by some Muslim youth called Trends. And brothers and sisters, you must be as wise as the people of this world who study trends. They don't just look at what's happening, they make projections. What happens if the Muslims continue at this pace? that they're going 6 million, 7 million, 8 million Muslims in America, 10 million, 20 million Muslims in America. They think like that. They said, oh, Suraj Wahaj, he's got nine babies. Now, if each of one of them have nine children, Imam al -Amin got 30 children. Now, if they get married and they have all these children, they start thinking, they start calculating. But they don't calculate just tomorrow, they calculate 10 years from now, 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now, because they're smart, they understand trends. And you, brothers and sisters, and I, I, leadership, must understand trends. I gave a lecture in the University of Michigan, and when the lecture was over, it was attended by many Jews. A Jewish professor, a woman, said, Mr. Imam Saraj Wahaj, tell me, if Muslims become the, pop, uh, the um, majority of people, in this country, and if you vote, would you then vote to implement the Sharia? What you say? To implement the Sharia. You know why? Because she's thinking now. You know what? These Muslims are beginning to have influence. Went to one masjid and one day 15 people took Shahada. Uh-oh, what does that mean? Muslims talking about voting. 50,000 Muslims in Washington, D.C. What does that mean? We got to watch out because these Muslims now are growing and they're developing and I am afraid. Think, 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 think. Pharaoh, mass big and great Pharaoh, powerful Pharaoh, yet Pharaoh goes and kill babies. Why are you killing babies? Why are you killing male babies, Pharaoh? Why? You strong, you powerful. Why are you killing babies? Because you know one day if the trend continues and the babies grow up, you're going to have to deal with these men. These baby boys that you like to kill now. One day, if you don't stop them now, you're going to have to deal with them on the battlefield. Mujahideen, Fisa Bililah. Listen. Listen. President Farrell, I mean President Clinton, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. They have a plan. What's the plan? For my sister who think that our condition is negative, look. Look at a seed. Some people are wise enough to look at a seed and say, yes, that seed will become a tree. And I'll tell you what kind of tree it's going to become, but everybody can't see it. Some people can't recognize it until the seed is planted and it begins to grow. And when it grows a little bit, some other people will say, yeah, I know what that's going to be. That's going to be an apple tree, but still some can't see it. Then it begins to grow more and more. 
and then finally it bears fruit and you see the apples and you say yeah that's an apple tree but when I look out in this audience when I look at a Bosnia and Somali and Sudan Kashmir in Iraq and Iran when I look in uh, Malaysia Indonesia and Pakistan and in Bangladesh India Nigeria when you look at the Muslims, what do you see? You see seeds. Potential. Potential. If you plant it in the right environment, let it grow. That acorn will become a tree 100 feet in the sky. A little seed. That's what they see. They see seeds. Because in the seed, they have all that you need. It's in the seed already. You have the deen. You have Islam. You have the Quran. You have La ilaha illallah. You have Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You have Iman. You have faith. You have taqwa. It's a seed. Let it grow. And watch out. And this is what they fear. Oh, brothers and sisters, they're not afraid of you going to the masjid and making prayer. No. They don't care if you fast on the month of Ramadan. No. What they are concerned about is the political and economic implication of being Muslim. My loyalty, I say it here in this convention, and they will take it around the world. My loyalty is not to the government of the United States of America. My loyalty is to Allah the messenger and the believers that's where my loyalty is and if you have on the earth one billion Muslims loyalty to Allah and the messenger what kind of earth will we have we have an earth of peace and justice and this is what they fear this Muslim masses if they ever got together would be a powerful lot you know what it's about to them it's about markets it's about control of, of, of uh, resources of the world. So if you and I wake up, brothers and sisters, and we say, look, let us agree to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. That's the key, I agree. If we do that, the implications will be phenomenal. I leave you with this. Brothers and sisters, I'm going back to New York City, inshallah more confident than ever my head is not down i don't feel that we defeated no uh -uh. quite the contrary i feel as confident as ever before i want to spend more money as ever before to build islamic schools i want to work harder than ever before for islamic unity you saw here last night our leadership stood before you and said, let's, let's have this national shura. Now what will you do? Will you go back to Washington, D.C. and Virginia, business as usual? Will you go back to Detroit, the same old thing? Or will you be renewed and say, yes, look at the direction of Isna and Ikna and the ministry of Imam Waratuddin Muhammad and Imam Jamil Alameen and the rest of the Muslim leadership. Let's do the same thing in our city. Let's go back to Canada. Toronto. Toronto's a stronghold. Why not duplicate what we saw here in Toronto? Demand the leadership to come together, Tisa Bililah, and all over Canada and all over the country to work for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I say brothers and sisters, Everything that's happening in this earth is an opportunity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us to unite. I don't think that we will achieve, achieve unity by going directly after unity. But to me, unity is the byproduct of us working for Allah. وَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِهِمْ لَأَنْفَقْتَ مَا فِي الْعَضِ جَمِيعًا مَا أَلَّفْتَ مَا بَيْنَ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَلَكِنَ اللَّهَ أَلَّفَ بَيْنَهُمْ Allah has joined your hearts together. Not if you've spent all the money on the earth, could you have done it? Nah, but Allah has done it.
we love each other for the pleasure of Allah. I close with this. I was at an airport in New York City on my way to Chicago for fundraiser dinner, Bosnia. I did something that I never did before. I was standing online waiting to get my ticket. And as I stood there, lies my witness. Something compelled me to get off the line to go to a newsstand to buy some newspapers. When I got to the newsstand, I saw a magazine called Life Magazine, of which I don't buy. I buy Newsweek, I buy Times Magazine, I buy U.S. News and World Report, but I don't buy a Life Magazine. But there was a cover on the Life Magazine that had such an impact on me that it changed my talk in Chicago. And my talk was based upon what I saw in this magazine. And it is so deep what I saw in this magazine, I'm recommending that every Muslim here get the latest copy of Life magazine. I have it here. If the organizers want to make copies of the article, I'll give it to them and they can make copies. This, I'm finished. But look at, listen to the headline. The year of the killer weather. Why has nature gone mad? You better read this article. But I'd like to change the title. I would like to reread it to say, the year of the killer weather, why is Allah angry? Because the weather is not uh, mother nature. Mother nature is impersonal. It's Allah. And let me just read this one sentence, I'm finished. Listen. This, by the way, this is an article written by a man named Stephen Petranik. It's not a Muslim. It's not Quran. It's not Hadith. This is how weird our weather has been. The three most damaging climatic disasters in United States history happened in the last past 12 months. First, Hurricane Andrew devastated South Florida last September. Then on March 12th, a giant blizzard, which the National Weather Service calls the single biggest storm of the century. It swept from Florida to Maine, releasing more snow, hail, rain, and sleet than any other storm since 1888. Finally, the relentless rain flooding the Midwest brought on what may be the costliest weather disaster of it all. Also, this magazine talks about one of the greatest droughts in the history of this nation is now. Also, it mentioned that this last year was a record-breaking number of tornadoes in America, and they said next year will probably be worse. What's happening in America? You may not know it, you may not understand it, you may not believe it. You may say, I don't want to hear it, but Allah is angry at America for what she has done around the world. And one of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Muntaqeen, the Avenger. You can't keep on killing people, murdering people, being unjust, and don't think that you have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people don't want to hear that. But brothers, sisters, it's true. And this is my concern. If America is a ship sinking, as I believe it is, I painted this picture years ago, I say the same picture today. America is like a, a car speeding down a steep mountain full of ice and snow with brakes that don't work, driven by a blind man, high off of drugs. But the problem is, Ahmed is in the back of the seat. So, Mr. Clinton driving the car, and you say, well, hold on, put your seatbelt on, put your seatbelt on. No, you become the passenger. And I say, brothers and sisters, why, why must we make America better? Why? 
We must make America better because we are the citizens here. And if we don't stop the hands from the oppression and the misguidance, then the ship will go down, they will be destroyed, and we will be destroyed too. But if we hold their hands, if we hold their hands, we will save them and save ourselves as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us, bless this conference. Don't you leave this conference. Don't you go back and sit back and relax. But when you get in the car, think, think, what can I do when I get back? What can I do when I get back to my state? When I get back to Canada, what will I do? Get together, talk over the strategy of the ISNA conference, and go back and implement in your own personal life, in the life of the masters in your area. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and help us and guide us. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Takbir. Uh, with these uh, thought provoking speeches and very moving words, we come to the end of this session. I know you might have some questions, but the speakers will be here. You can talk to them, so we directly move to the next session. Please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You remember that Urdu verse, Rozi Hisab, Pesh Ho, Jabmera, Daftari Amal. The session that we have after this is that Rosi Hisab, the, the session of accountability for the leaders of Islamic society of North America. We certainly appreciate the generosity with which you offered your monetary support yesterday for Islamic society of North America. But what is much more important is your ideas, your suggestions, your support that will make this organization stronger. So please, the next session is the session where we will have more from you. We will listen to your ideas, your critique. So therefore, it is crucial that you be here and bring more brothers and sisters who might not have participated in the first session. Now, the question that has been repeated again and again, how many Muslims have attended this convention? We don't yet have a final count, but they told me that in this hall there can be 10,000, there are 10,000 seats in this hall. And yesterday, at the peak of the session, about 80% of this hall was full. Takbir! Takbir! So please, immediately after the session, we will have the executive committee members of the ISNA here, and we will have your suggestions and your questions. We will have longer time for that particular session for questions and suggestions. So we will conclude here, and we will have the ISNA vision immediately now. Yeah. On site this morning is sponsored by Mercy International, giving a grain of hope to humanity, and by the Muslim Journal, bringing humanity together in moral excellence with truth and understanding. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, the likeness of those who spend their wealth in the way of Allah is as the likeness of a grain that sprouts seven spikes. In every spike, a hundred grains. And Allah multiplies for whom he wills. Allah is all-embracing, all-knowing. You can give a grain of hope. Please call Mercy International at 313-421-CARE. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Ismail Abdurrahim. And I'm Selma Jukic, and welcome to On Site This Morning, the show that keeps you on your toes for this ISNA's 30th Annual Convention. For those of you who are attending this convention, you may or you may not know that there's another convention with thousands of gatherers that's happening in Detroit. It's called the Muslim Convention under the ministry of Wadif Dean Muhammad 
We sent a film crew there to capture ISNA's president, Abdullah Idris Ali, giving an address. Here's what we have. 